You may know that we have been in a series that we're calling The Question No One Is Asking. And But we hope that it's a question that everyone begins to ask. We took the series, it's one that Trent and I heard that North Point Community Church had done. It was such a meaningful series to us. We wanted to take that, adapt that. Uh, we even gave it a little bit of a different name, but it's a, kind of the same material. And especially today's message was one that hit home with me and one that I wish I had heard a long time ago. But it began four weeks ago when we asked this question. I'm going to put it on the screen for you this morning. I want you to all say it with me. What is the thing to do? Y'all did better than first service. Do it again. Like, what is the wise thing to do? Not what's the legal thing. We're all accountable to the legal thing, aren't we? Not even what's the right thing. This is better than the right thing. This is the harder question. What's the wise thing to do? In light of my past, because we all have a past, don't we? And you do know something, that thing, that something, just because it's not wrong, because of my past, it might be something that's not best or not wise for me to do. We said in light of my current circumstances, which change as we grow and, and our life situation changes, and in light of our future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for me to do? It would be a question that would be in your own self-interest to ask. It would be a question that if you ask it and answer it could lead to fewer regrets in your life. Last week we asked this question in light of one area of your life. Does anyone remember what that area was? Time, good, in the area of your time. Today we're going to talk about it in a different area of your life, an area that really is a bit uncomfortable at times to talk about. But we're going to talk about it anyway. Uh, because I've realized that you never really grow just by being comfortable. You grow when you stretch yourself outside those limits. So I want to begin with a question. Have you ever done something or talked yourself into doing something that you later regretted? Have you ever talked yourself into doing something that you later regretted? Man, I knew I shouldn't have done there, but I taught gone there, but I taught myself into it and I went. I knew I shouldn't have gone on that date. I knew I shouldn't have taken that job. I knew I shouldn't have fill in the blank, whatever it is. And later on you thought I was right. I shouldn't have done it. And for many of us, that kind of talking ourselves into something began with a statement that we would make. We would say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with. I mean, there's nothing wrong with. I mean, there's nothing wrong with. And while wrong was over here, and I was way over here, it wasn't that I made the jump from here to there. It was little steps, wasn't it, that I took along the way that got me to what was wrong. Ah, oh, he asked me out on the date. Yeah, but you know his reputation. No, you know what he's like. Yeah, but I'm going to be different. And he's so cute. And, oh. He comes along and says, hey, baby, you know, I know we went out and I know we said we were going to go to wherever it is we said we were going to go. But how about, how about we just go get something to go? And I've got this nice little place up. It's kind of secluded. It's by itself. We can put the top down. We can get the bed of the pickup truck and we can look at the stars. God made the stars, you know. Isn't it good? God? I mean, this is a God thing. I mean, I should be doing this. <laughs> and you get there and, ooh, he begins to reach us over and he puts his arm around you. Like, oh, there's nothing wrong with putting his arm around. There's nothing with scooting over next to him because he's so cute. Did I mention that? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with a little kiss. I mean, what's a kiss or two the way the Frenchmen do? What's wrong with that? I mean, <laughs> do you like that little rhyme I made up? <laughs> And did I mention, and it wasn't that you jumped over here, it was that you, it snuck up on you, didn't you? All of a sudden, wrong was over there, and you didn't jump there, you just kind of crawled there little by little. So let me ask you a question, would you say that this is true? Bad moral decisions, and you define bad however you want to, bad moral decisions are generally preceded by a series of not wrong, but unwise decisions. Would you say that's true in your life? The bad moral decision, however you define, I'm not even going to define moral for you this morning. You define it for yourself because we all have a standard, don't we? Bad moral 
decisions, however you define that, are generally not jumped into, but they're preceded by a series of unwise decisions. It's the way the world works. Maybe for you it was that argument over spring break. Should I go? Should I not go? Should I go? Should I not go? And your mom said, don't go. Your dad said, don't go. But you decided to go. And one decision led to another, which led to another, which led to another. Because generally, our greatest moral regrets didn't happen at once. And they came with the same things like, well, there's nothing wrong with lunch. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with lunch. I mean, we all have to eat, don't we? I mean, he has to eat, she has to eat, but I'm married, she's married. What does it matter? We all got to eat. So there's nothing wrong with lunch. And, And speaking of lunch, you know, I get hungry again. There's nothing wrong with dinner. I mean, there's nothing wrong with dinner. We can have dinner. And why can't we have dinner? I mean, we work together. She works together. We all work together. We all, you know, we were all going to go. But then they dropped out. And then we just ordered in and had lunch, had dinner in the office. Nothing wrong with dinner. Speaking of that, Tom, are you saying that it's wrong, like working late together at night, like working late together? Is that wrong? There's nothing wrong with that, Tom. And, and there's nothing wrong in having dinner at night working late, confiding in him or her. I mean, there's nothing wrong with confiding, is there? I mean, oh, I hate to tell you, my marriage, it's just been rough lately. A lot of things going on, and we just haven't been as close as we used to be. And, and there's nothing wrong with listening, is there? On the other hand, oh, bless your heart. Here, hold my hand just a second. Here, hold my hand, would you? I mean, there's nothing wrong with holding hands, is there? And there's nothing wrong with a little Southern, bless your heart, things are just not going well. And oh, let me give you a hug. Let me just hug you, honey. Nothing wrong with a hug. I mean, Tom, are you saying there's something wrong with a hug? And, And maybe I'm exaggerating, but maybe. If this were your favorite TV show and you were watching an episode of this, And there was lunch, followed by dinner, followed by a little working out late at night, followed by a little of confiding in and listening to, followed by a hug, and the lights went off on the screen and the credits came up. You would be saying, "Mm, I wish I knew what was going to happen, but you'd be tuning in next week because you know what's about to happen, don't you? And maybe I'm old-fashioned, and maybe I'm just wondering a little bit, but let me ask you a question. What if this is your friend at work? What if it's a friend and you know her husband? You know his wife, and your kids have played together, and you've seen each other at times, and she's been over to your house, and they've been over to your house. What advice would you give them? Ah, go for it. (laughs) Ah, nothing wrong with Adam. She's a hottie. He looks good. Go for it. Do it. Or maybe get a little bit more personal. What if it's not someone you know? What if it's you? And if you're honest with yourself, you would say, well, there's nothing wrong with. There's nothing wrong with. There's nothing wrong with. But you get to a point where if you're honest, You would even tell yourself, but something's not right either. And I know something about you because it's true with me. We have a hard time admitting that to ourselves, don't we? We have a hard time admitting to ourselves what anyone on the outside looking in could see. Because I talk with people on practically a weekly basis who know this, that it wasn't one bad decision that brought them into my office or Trent's office or Dan's office. It was a series of things that led to things. And living, as one person said, I'm just living on the edge. And living on the edge is great if you're a skydiver. I mean, if you want to skydive, walk right up to the edge of the plane, get there, and one, two, three, jump, and give it everything you've got and go over the edge. 
edge. <laughs> live on the edge. And living on the edge is great if you're a skier and you've been learning and you go up a double black diamond slope and you're the edge of a 10-foot cornice and you're looking down and there's deep snow. Jump. Go with it. Shout Joshua 1-9. Be strong and courageous and just do it. Go for it. And living on the edge is great if you're on a budget and you've got shoe money left over at the end of the month. Buy that extra pair of shoes. <laughs> But living on the edge, come on now, it's not so great when it comes to things sexual and things relational. Because there are certain lines, once you cross them as much as you would like to go back, you can't. So let me ask you, if there was a God who loved you, and there was a God who cared about you, what do you think He would say to you on this subject? Do you think he would say, live on the edge, <laughs> go for it, give it all you've got? Or do you think that he would tell you what you would tell your teenage daughter? Or do you think he would tell you what you tell your teenage son? So the Apostle Paul, writing to a group of Christians living in the city of Corinth, who is a very, very immoral city. And even in the church there, a lot of things were going on that were just very sexually inappropriate. And Paul comes to them. And these people, while living in the world, have been brought into Christ. And they're living in the church. And Paul gives them some wisdom that I think was applicable to us today. Listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, this group of believers, he says, Flee. You know what flee means? Run. Flee from sexual immorality. In fact, I want you to turn to the person beside you, look at them and say, flee from sexual immorality. That last part was a little bit harder, so we'll just practice the flee part. Just say, flee, this section here. Look at the person beside you and say, flee. Not out, you know a flea, you just want to get it off of you, don't you? Get it off. This side say run. Because that's what flea means. It means flea, run, get away from, don't flirt with, don't hang around with, don't date with, don't cozy up next to it in the car. He says flee from sexual immorality. Then he goes on, and this is, you know, this is where I think you may be saying, Tom, that's a little bit old-fashioned, don't you think? I mean, flee, run from sexual immorality, that's a little bit. Why won't you just get on the train and catch up with us to the 21st century? And you would be a little bit more applicable. But I bet you agree with Paul and God more than you think you do at this point. Because I bet you every man out here would say that is what they would want their wife to do. I bet you that there's not a lady in the house who doesn't want that for their husband. I bet you there's not a girlfriend here or a boyfriend here who doesn't want that for the person you date. And this is the part sometimes I get emotional just thinking about it. I bet there's not a student on these premises who packed up Friday night to go to dad's house and who'll be packing back up tonight to go to mom's house who wishes and wishes and wishes that their mom or dad had done this very thing. Old fashioned? I think it's very up to date. Very modern. And then Paul says something. Paul says something that, that, that counselors now are really just beginning to find out. Listen to what he says. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits. All other sins. He says they're in a category all their own. He says, I'm going to put everything else over here and I'm going to put all other sins over here. Do you know that studies show in counseling that when there is great emotional pain, that there is great emotional guilt, that almost every one of those cases, in the vast majority, it goes back to something sexual. People move on from all types of things. People move on from hitting their little sister. People move on from stealing pepperonis off of their sister's pizza. People move on from even talking bad about other people. But it is very, very difficult. 
Paul would say, to move on from sexual sin. He goes on, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He says sexual sin is in a category all its own, and it's not in a category all its own because it's worse than other sins. You know how we have these sin scales? I, I do this little bitty sin, and you do this great big sin, so you've got a lot to do, you've not got a little to do. It's not wrong like that because that really is it's kind of a false thing to begin with because all sin separates us. He says it's in a category all its own, not because it's worse than other sins, but because the consequences are worse than other sins. The consequences are worse. And Paul says, you should know that because of what you can see, he says, because you have seen that families get ripped apart and because you have seen that kids have to spend half the time here and half the time here and because you can see the great debate happening in your company, in your country now, which is absolutely outrageous to me, that thousands of babies are aborted and people stand up and act like that's okay. <laughs> And we wonder, Paul says, because you can see that, because you live in a land now where they can have an ultrasound and you can see. Because kids are here one place and gone to another. Paul says, you don't even have to have a Bible to figure that out. And you don't even have to believe in God to figure that out. It's not worse because it's worse on the worst scale. It's worse because the consequences are far reaching and they are far greater and they cause great emotional pain. And he says it's not worse or it's not in a category all by itself because it's not forgivable. I mean it is as forgivable as anything else but be honest with yourself. You can forgive yourself for hitting your little sister, can't you? And you can forgive yourself for telling a lie to somebody or stretching the truth with your mom and dad but let me tell you it is very, very difficult for us to even forgive ourselves in this area. Paul says, there is something on the inside of you, the way that God made you, that it's not just a physical act between two people. It is two people uniting. And whether you want to believe it or not, it is a tearing apart when you take that outside the bounds of what God made. He's saying, you know, you can get forgiven. In fact, Jesus even tells a story, or John records a story about Jesus, a lady who's caught in the very act of adultery. And John says Jesus was the only one there who was willing to forgive her, to extend grace to her. And that grace was there, but we often leave the story there. That Jesus looked at her and said, I love you, I accept you, but quit doing this. It hurts you. He didn't say quit doing it because he wanted to spoil her fun. He said quit doing it because it hurts you. It's not worse or a separate category because of the sin scale or because forgiveness. That says it's worse because it was to you. So hey, from a God who loves you, he says flee from sexual immorality, but he doesn't stop there. Have you ever told your kids to stop something, but then you leave it there? What's the very thing they want to do? <laughs> that very thing you told them to stop doing in it. I struggle with that with my wife. This is confessions of a broken pastor. <laughs> if my wife tells me to stop something, do you know what I want to do? The very thing she told me to stop. And you know where I want to do it? Right in front of her. <laughs> it's like, I'll show you. Stop that. <laughs> so I'm so glad that Paul doesn't look at this and just say, stop it, quit it. <laughs> but he says, not only stop it, quit it. He says, this is what I'm going to tell you to do. Run from sexual immorality. And instead, look at the next verse. He raises the bar. He says, instead of running towards it, this is what I want you to do. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 6.20, therefore, Honor God with your bodies. 
Honor God with your bodies. That is such a different standard than, hey, what can I get by with? Honor God with your bodies. That is such a different standard than, will anybody get pregnant? Will anybody get caught? Does God say anything against it? Is it right? Is it wrong? That is such a different standard. Paul says, I'm raising the level up here, and I'm going to tell you what I would like for you to do with those bodies God gave you. Would you honor your Heavenly Father with your bodies instead of saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong here. There's nothing wrong here. Ask yourselves, and what I'm doing is where I'm headed. Will it be honoring to God? And to know what you're thinking. You're thinking what a lot of people think. Tom, you are a joy killer. (laughs) You are a fun murderer. That's what you are. You just murdered my Saturday nights, my Friday nights. You put them in a can. Let me ask you a question. What if for the next year you made a decision? Whether you're single, dating, married, divorced, single again. What if you made the decision to honor God with your body? What would that look like? Do you think at the end of a year you would have more regrets or fewer regrets? Do you think at the end of a year you would be more healthy or less healthy? Do you think that at the end of the year you would be more emotionally stable or less? What do you think would happen to your relationships over the next year? If you said, God, for the next year, I'm taking time off. I met a lady out in the lobby, and I, I, I kind of hinted everywhere in the way in the world. I wanted her to come in here and just talk to you. She said, she said, it may sound crazy. It was after first service. She said, but I did what you said. She said, Tom, I was just, I was all over the place, and I was seeking fulfillment in everything out there, and what I did, and what I watched, and just like throwing it to the wind. And finally, God convicted me, and I just took a year off. And I said, a year. He said, I even had a guy come up and ask me for a date. And I said, hey, what are you doing? February, a year from now. What are you, I mean, if you're still interested, maybe call me back. And she looked and she said, I learned more about myself and I got closer to my Heavenly Father and I am the person I am today because I took that time and I did that. Or maybe you're saying, Tom, that's crazy. Nobody else is doing that. So what? That's just a statement of fact. Nobody else is doing it. What you're really saying is this, so nobody else is doing it, so I want to do it. Nobody else is doing it. I mean, that's nothing. That's just a statement. And you look and you say, you know, you know, I want to be like everybody else. And I'm going to tell you, you don't want to be like everybody else. As you're a pastor, and as someone who tries to help people pick up the pieces on a weekly basis, I'm going to tell you, you don't want a marriage like everybody else's. You want a better marriage. And you don't want a past like everybody else's past. You want a better past. And you want, you want what God said was exceedingly abundantly above everything you could ask or imagine. Everybody else is doing it. That's not an argument for. That's an argument to stay away from. So here's the challenge. No matter where you fall on the spectrum, would you take the next year and just decide, I want to honor God with the body he gave me. Whatever that means for you. Some of you may need to stop dating. Some of you may need to go home today and move out. Some of you may need to quit your job. Some of you may need to sell your TV, cancel HBO, cancel cable. That's extreme. Yeah, it is. But what would you give for a year of your life? I want to see you sitting in my office, but not like a lot of the people I see sitting in there who are living on the ends with regrets. I want to see you sitting in there with the best life possible because I think you are worth a year of your life I just hope that you think you're worth a year of your life to just stop and ask the question God what could I do to honor you 
with this body I have. So Paul, Jesus, in light of my past, because we all got one, we all live with regrets of some life. You, it's hard to get through this life without a regret. But I promise you one thing. If you take this challenge, you will never, ever, ever get to a place where you look back and say, I regret that. Because your life will be better in every single way possible. In fact, you will be like that young lady out there in the lobby who said it was the hardest at first, but it became the best year of my life. So in light of your past, in light of your current circumstances, man, I just graduated. I'm away from home for the first time. I just, I just got married. I just got a new job. In light of your future hopes and dreams, in light of the children you want one day, in light of the wife you want one day or the husband you want one day, in light of the kids you want, in the light of the way you want to feel about you, don't ask what is everybody else doing. Don't get caught up in the nobody else is doing that phase. Don't get as close to the line as you can, but ask, God, how could I honor you with my body? So regarding your bodies, what do you think is the wise thing 